Well, hello and welcome back to Rare Classic Cars. Today it's another beautiful early fall day, let's say, on the weekend. And we're going to have another porch chat because I hadn't done one of those for a while and a number of you seem to enjoy it. So, well, let's do it again. And I've even brought back my handy dandy dry erase board here. For those who used to watch Meet the Press with Tim Russert back in the day, I think he's been deceased for 15 or so years now, but yeah, I used to enjoy that. And that's the inspiration. I think he always had a red Expo marker too. So in honor of Tim Russert, we're gonna have our little dry erase board here. And today what we're gonna talk about are some of the top classic cars that you don't want to own, and some that you do, but principally the ones that you don't wanna own and why. Drop a comment in the comment section if I'm forgetting one. This is just a list of a few that came to mind but I'm sure there are some others. So let's get started and pull out the dry erase board. At number one, we have the Chevrolet Vega. Ooh, ooh, the Vega. Uh, the Vega was introduced for the 1971 model year, carried on through 1977, and it was an attractive little car, let me say, to begin with. I think the Vegas look great, especially the earlier ones without the big bumpers. They're, they're lookers. But in addition to just rusting when you breathed on them, the principal issue with the Vega was its 2.3 liter, 440 cubic inch engine under hood, which was an aluminum block with Siamese cylinder walls, an open deck design, uh, and it had iron heads. And it didn't have any cylinder liners in it. So it's a sleeveless aluminum block engine and while that technology would go on to be perfected by various German makes like Porsche and BMW, it just was not perfected at the time of the Vega. And there were some reasons for this. Part of the issue was that the car had a tendency to overheat. And why is that? Well, when the Vega was being designed, it was actually intended to be designed without a radiator. Now, why would they do that? Well, you can imagine this is a small car, a subcompact car. And of course, GM's trying to save money, so big costly components, the radiator. Well, take the radiator out of the car. You got an aluminum block. It can just transfer heat better than a cast iron block out to the ambient air. Well, that didn't work so well. And in various testing, they found that cars, particularly you can imagine the ones equipped with air conditioning, needed a radiator. And so what did Chevrolet do? They put a radiator that was about a foot by a foot. It's the smallest radiator that I think I've ever seen in a liquid-cooled car, maybe outside of an Austin Mini or something like that. Maybe even the Mini's got a bigger one. I don't know. But uh, in any case, it's such a small radiator, and when GM was executing the testing on the engine with this cooling system, the test procedures, I would say, really doomed the car in real life because the first step of the test procedures was to check all the fluid levels. So the engineers would check the fluid levels, then begin with the durability test. And the car, I think, proved okay. It, it, it passed the durability test. It didn't overheat. The problem is that's not what everybody does. You don't just go, and before you start your car every morning, go and check the fluid level. And cars do lose some coolant over time, particularly in hot temperatures. So what happened? With that little cooling capacity, you start losing coolant from it and uh, it becomes inadequate and then the engine overheats and when you have an overheat in an aluminum block engine with no cylinder liners uh, then the piston rings are scuffing the cylinder walls and from that point on it's an oil burner. So that engine really just had a ton of issues I would say principally because it didn't have any cast iron cylinder liners in it and the cooling system was inadequate. Uh, it was a little single overhead cam, four-cylinder. It made, depending upon what year, between 70 and 90 net horsepower. 71, it was gross horsepower ratings, and the top two-barrel version, I think, made 110 horsepower. But it just wasn't anything to really write home about. And on top of that, the reputation for durability became so bad that GM actually redesigned the engine and called it the Durabilt 140. I believe starting in the 1976 model year and then continuing on through 1977, which was the last model year for the Vega. So if you're gonna, if you really need that Vega, get a 76 or 77. Unfortunately, they don't look as good because they got the big bumpers, but the engine is better. They actually, I think Chevrolet uh, advertised that they hired an independent testing agency to drive Vegas with that new engine out in the desert climates for days on end and 60,000 miles. 
and they basically did it with no issue. I think the only issue that they had on one of the cars they had to replace an air conditioning belt or something like that. But they were trying to prove to the public that this engine was actually quite good. And in reality, it was not. Vega's also got some weird quirks. Uh, it's one of the few GM cars of the era that has an electric fuel pump in the tank. That can be good or bad. Um, I would prefer, now that those fuel pumps are 50-some years old, not to necessarily have that in the tank. But that wasn't the first GM car with an electric fuel pump. I think the first was the 70 Riviera. Uh, and that may have even been a few years, model years before that. My 67 Riviera has a mechanical pump, but by 70, they definitely had electric fuel pumps, only in the Riviera, not in the full-size cars. I guess they thought somebody was going to be hot-rodding their Riviera. I don't know. But in any event, the Vega is the top one on the list that you don't want. Now, number two, we've got HT4100 Cadillacs. And I put a slash V864 here, but... I'm going to talk about that. The V864, that was a one-year-only item in 1981 for non-limousine cars, is actually not a bad engine. It's a Cadillac 368 cubic inch, big cast iron V8, same physical size as Cadillac 500 cubic inch V8, so it's really quite over-engineered. And you can disconnect the wire, and the uh, displacement modulation is effectively unhooked, and then the engine's fine. Uh, and it's a really good engine. So I'm not going to put the V864 up there, although customers had issues with it when it was new uh, because the system wasn't always reliable. But, you know, nowadays if you buy one and the system is still active, if you want, you can easily deactivate it and you have a good, reliable engine. But the HT4100 Cadillacs, that engine came out in 1982 and continued on through 1987. There were some, I would say, decent improvements beginning in 1985. They did strengthen the block, but again, you got an aluminum block GM engine with an iron head. Ooh, not good. But they did put uh, cast iron cylinder liners in this one, so they did learn from the Vega. Unfortunately, this was also during a GM era where they were trying to use a lot of RTV as opposed to, or room temperature vulcanizing sealant as opposed to gaskets. And in order for that to work, you've got to have perfectly clean surfaces, and obviously you have to apply it correctly and let it cure correctly. Well, that wasn't always the case. And on top of that, this engine is an aluminum block, iron head, aluminum intake. And so what happens there is you have aluminum and cast iron are expanding and contracting at different rates. And you know, you've got kind of two surfaces that are expanding at similar rates, sandwiching one that's expanding at a different rate. And it put real stress on intake gaskets, and then if the intake gasket blew, the car would overheat, uh, and then the head gasket would blow, and coolant would leak in the oil, and once the coolant leaks in the oil, the crankshaft gets chewed up, the cam bearings would get chewed up. These had, GMs had pretty soft cams for a number of years in the late 70s and early 80s, even the Chevy V8s, like the 305s, and some of the 350s even. So you, that's something to bear, bear in mind as you're looking at a GM car of this era, some of them did have soft cams. I had a HT4185 Cadillac that I got with 26,000 miles on it, and uh, it had flat cam lobes. <laughs> I have the camshaft. I saved it, and the, the lifters had huge divots in them. Uh, part of that, I think, was the car overheated, and the intake gasket blew, maybe even the head gasket blew, and the coolant leaked into the oil, and whomever repaired the car uh, put in a new crankshaft, did a lot of work on it, but didn't touch the camshaft, and they really needed to. But you don't want these HD4100 Cadillac cars unless you're budgeting for a new engine. And you make that part of your, I guess, purchase price thoughts on the car. Uh, and if you do that and you get it for a good price, then it's fine. I've actually, I'm, I'm kind of dinging this engine, but I've owned four or five cars with it. I've never had an issue you do have to change the coolant every two to three years, I would say. They recommend it every year. But if you're just driving occasionally every two to three years, and you have to do it with the engine coolant seal supplement tabs, that uh, basically the bars leaks tabs. Um, and if you do that, you should be okay. And if you don't push the engine, so I'm putting a lot of caveats on it. But I've these cars you could pick up for nothing because they had a poor reputation for reliability. I would say they're reliable until they aren't. I never was stranded with one of these cars in all my years of ownership. And I never, like I said, had a problem with the intake gaskets or head gaskets, but I changed the coolant 
and I would always just kind of tenderfoot the accelerator pedal until the engine was warmed up. Uh, I think the problem here was you had an engine that made 135 horsepower in the early rear wheel drive applications in cars that were weighing 38, 3,900 pounds. People would start it up, pull out on the main road, have to floor it to get up to speed. And then you're putting undue stress on the engine and causing the aluminum and cast iron to expand and heat up faster than it otherwise would. Um, so I lived by those rules and I drove these cars as daily drivers for years. I had, a, I had actually two 85 Cadillacs at one point in time that were daily drivers. I thought they were great, but you got to be careful. And also the 85 front wheel drive C body cars, the DeVille and Fleetwood, don't have great transmissions. They have the Turbo Hydromatic 440T4, GM's first year of a front wheel drive, transversely mounted front wheel drive transmission in a full size car. And they had a number of teething issues. 85 was not a good year. One of my 85 Cadillacs actually had a transmission uh, torque converter whine. It was pretty no noticeable. It was pretty loud until the torque converter locked up. And uh, I thought, uh oh, well, I paid 800 bucks for the car. We'll see what happens. I drove it for 50, 60,000 miles that way. And I sold the car after that. It was still running. So sometimes that just happens. It was, I think, a torque converter whine, something. But like I said, I put 50, 60,000 miles on it, sold it with around, I think, 76, 80,000 miles. And it still drove fine. It was a comfy car. So HT4100 Cadillac avoid. Uh, when you get to 1988, they came out with a 4.5 liter Cadillac V8, much better, more power. Uh, around 155 horsepower, and that engine got better and better to the point that in 1991 it was a 4.9 liter, made 200 horsepower, 270 pound feet of torque, really nice engine. Only thing I would say you got to be careful of on some of those is make sure when you start you don't hear a main bearing knock. That can be benign, but you just don't want a knocking engine, and some of those did have a tendency to have a main bearing knock too. And the HD4100 also had in from 82 to probably 85 oil pump issues. Yeah, you just don't want it. Uh, unless you budget for a new engine or engine repairs, you get the car at a good price. And the cars are slow. That's a slow, it's fine in the front wheel drive cars, the, the transversely mounted front wheel drive cars. If you buy a Cadillac like a 83 Fleetwood or DeVille with that, probably 16, 17 seconds, zero to 60 car. You don't want that. Let's go to number three, Chrysler's electronic lean burn setup. So this was introduced by Chrysler in the mid-1970s, and it's basically a computer feedback carburetor system, uh, and also the computer controls the spark advance, and a number of other functions too. Uh, but it's sensing ambient air temperature, uh, manifold absolute pressure, throttle position, uh, engine coolant temperature, and then it determines what the spark advance is and the fuel uh, air-to-fuel ratio. And you can imagine it's called lean burn because, well, the stoichiometric ratio or the air to fuel ratio on these was about 18 to 1, I believe. The optimum was about 14 and a half, 14.7 to 1. So why did Chrysler do that? Well, they could meet emission standards without a catalytic converter with this lean burn setup. But as I just said, it's a computer and it's under hood. Chrysler would mount the computer to the air cleaner on these and well, you can imagine then the computer is in an environment where it's going through a bunch of thermal cycling. Why you would do that, maybe because you wanted faster response times, because the computer was closer to the sensors, you didn't have to run wires through the car, like in, interior to the car. But yeah, not, not a great setup on these Chrysler's. They would use a similar setup all the way through the late 80s on the Fifth Avenue's Diplomats and Grand Furies, things like that. But the lean burns can be tricky to get running correctly. Um, they came with Carter Thermoquad carburetors when they were first introduced on Chrysler's. And tuning them is, is hard because when you're just driving the car around town, the computer is not commanding a lot of spark advance. But in order to get good fuel economy, when you go out on the freeway and you drive the car for extended periods of time with your foot on the accelerator, in other words, it's not in close throttle position, then the computer will advance the spark. And so what happens is you have to tune it. If you're one of those people who likes to advance the distributor and the timing to the point of spark knock, you basically have to do that and then take the car on the freeway and drive it for about 10 minutes on the freeway, come off the freeway and see if it's spark knocking at that point. Because not only is the engine hot, 
but the computer is commanding the most spark advance. And then when you take your foot off the accelerator, I think every 30 seconds the computer basically retards the timing until it basically comes down to a base setting. So the cars feel boggy around town. You'll find that they feel peppier after they come off the freeway, and that's why. It's because the computer is commanding more spark advance until you're back in the stop and go driving, and then it's retarding the timing. Now, why did it do that? If you retard the timing, it produces less emissions, at least by the emission standards that were in place at the time. Same with having a lean setup. It produced less emissions, and that's why that uh, was employed. But those cars are kind of tricky to tune, and I would say you might want to stay away from them. Although by the time you get to the Diplomats and the Grand Furies, and I would say the Fifth Avenues, it's a pretty reliable setup with the Chrysler 318 Underhood or the Slant 6. But, you know, some of those early lean burn Chryslers you may want to avoid. Let's talk about number four. Now this I'm going to throw people for a loop because we don't often talk about foreign cars, but I have owned foreign cars and motorcycles. Number four is a carbureted 80s era Honda. Now, why did I pick Honda? Now, a lot of Japanese cars of the year, why did I pick on the Japanese cars? I think during this time frame, most of uh, the Japanese cars had a reputation for great reliability, certainly better reliability than domestic cars. And I would say that was probably true during the era. The domestic cars weren't always built with the best quality. But if you've ever owned an 80s era Honda that has a carburetor on it, I have never seen a car with more vacuum lines. It was so bad that Honda had to number the vacuum lines. They're actually silkscreen with numbers on them for which number vacuum hose uh, it is. And I think there were 60 vacuum hoses, six zero, I want to say, on these Hondas. Just a huge amount of them. So there's a ton of vacuum hoses. There's a ton of dash pots under hood that the vacuum hoses go to and the control engine functions. They have a complicated... Uh, carburetor, I'm going to say the name wrong, it's not Keihin, it's K-E-I-H-I-N. I don't remember how to say that, but in any case, it's a three-barrel carburetor, like an idle. Uh, the idle passage is one of the Venturis, and they're hard to get parts for. It's hard to trace down if one of those dash pots goes bad. I had an 85 Honda CRX, which I loved driving. It had 14,000 miles on it. It was a fun car a fun car to drive. But I eventually just got tired of trying to trace down vacuum leaks and mess around with that carburetor. And again, the problem now is these cars are 40 years old, or in some cases, even more than that. So I would stay away from one of those unless you're really a glutton for punishment and you want to, uh, you want to chase down vacuum leaks. Some of those 80s era Hondas also had head gasket issues uh, with the engines. Uh, I never had a problem with mine. Mine never even came close to overheating. But that little four-cylinder, the four cylinders that Honda had back in the day, oh my God, are they little gems. They're so sweet. They run so well. The little four-cylinder is just so addicting. So in any case, I would say stay away from them, though, for that reason, unless you want to chase down vacuum leaks. Let's go on to the final one, and that is any GM car that's equipped with a turbo hydromatic 200 transmission outside of a T car like a Chevette I would say. Um, this GM turbo hydromatic 200 transmission GM tried to introduce a transmission that was lighter weight put it in applications that a turbo hydromatic 350 otherwise would have been in like full-size cars. The Caprices and Impalas that had 305s under hood they had turbo hydromatic 200 transmissions if you got the Olds 350 diesel Turbo Hydromatic 200 transmission. It just was not a reliable, robust transmission. It's almost like a grenade behind those engines. And if you have a car with it, I highly advise you to drive gingerly. Now, as that transmission evolved, it became the 204R. And that was even in vehicles like the Buick Grand National. And that was not a bad transmission. So if it's a four speed, it's not bad, but the uh, three-speed turbo hydromatic 200 transmission cars, they had all sorts of issues. You might even have a turbo hydromatic 200C that had the lockup converter. But this transmission, like I said, was in a lot of General Motors vehicles, intermediates, compacts, the Chevettes, everything from Chevettes to full-size Impalas and Caprices. And especially if somebody went to tow with it, uh-uh, not happening. So... <laughs> I would 
The way to identify this is if you're under the car, you can see the transmission pan says metric. And if it says metric, then I would say you're going to be in trouble. And it's best just to avoid this. Get a General Motors car that does not have a Turbo Hydromatic 200 transmission. Get, get something with a 350 or a 400, 425, something like that, and you'll be much, much happier. So then that comes to, well, what kind of cars do you want? And I'm not going to make an extensive list here because we've already taken up enough time on the don'ts. But I did say any pre-1972 big block equipped full-size sedan. I cannot think of a bad big block equipped full-size sedan and a big block engine that wasn't reliable. Whether that's a Chevrolet, Pontiac, Olds, Buick, Cadillac V8. Now somebody's going to say there's no Pontiac big block or small block. They're all the same. Okay, well, Pontiac, any Pontiac from 326 to 455 cubic inches is the same physical size, but what about the 265 and 301 that are shorter deck heights? What do you call that? In any case, uh, <laughs> Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac, those are all great big block engines. Ford, the FE engines, the Ford Edsel engines, 390s, 428s, or even 352s, uh, the 429s, the 460s, the MEL, Mercury Edsel Lincoln, 430s, 462s, Chrysler, the 400s and 440s. Uh, even, I would say, frankly, I should append this and say maybe even any pre-1972 Mopar small block because the 318s, um, I'm a GM guy, but I think the 318 rivals anything out there for durability. Just a great little engine, the 360s, uh, 383s. The Chevy 350 is a great engine, but it had some soft cam lobes in the late 70s and early 80s, so you got to be careful. But I guess if you stick to pre-1972, you're really before most of the emissions. I put 1972 as a break point because for Fords and, and uh, Chryslers, 1972 was the year that they, the first year of the lower compression engines. And you're down a little bit on power. The Ford big blocks with the D2 VE heads, they had a tendency to spark knock. So you might be running mid-grade or premium at this point to keep them from spark knocking. Um, I prefer the premium fuel big block V8s. You do have to run lead additive in them. If you don't want to be running lead additive or premium fuel with your high compression V8, get a 1972, maybe a 1973 big block equipped car. It's going to be better and more enjoyable than one from the later 70s once they put the catalytic converters on. Um, but again, I cannot think of a bad big block that was produced by the domestic automakers. I guess I could even put on here an AMC, any AMC that's equipped with a 304, 360, 401, excellent V8s that AMC made, excellent V8s. And they made great six cylinders too, 258s, 232s. Um, they even had an engine in Mexico that was larger than 258. The displacement is escaping my mind. But in any case, AMC had some great engines. So that's what you want to look for. You can pick your AMC with a six cylinder or one of their V8s. You can pick any big block GM or Ford vehicle, uh, a Chrysler with a big block, or even, like I said, a 318, a 360. That's what you want. And if you get the full size sedan, you get the big transmission. Pre-72, it's going to be a Turbo Hydromatic 350 or 400. It'll be a Ford uh, C6 as an example, maybe an FMX. You'll get the torque flight, the 727 torque flight. Bulletproof. I, I've owned, oh my gosh, I don't know how many cars over the years. Tens and tens and tens of cars, 65, 70 cars. I have never, not once, had a transmission issue on one of these full-size sedans with any of those transmissions, not one. The only issues I've ever had are modulator valves that have gone bad and then the transmission shifts bad, but that's one bolt and you pull the modulator valve out, I find an NOS one on eBay or something, put it in, shifts beautifully again. Um, I just can't say enough about how well built those engines and transmissions are. So find one of those, or I will say another little gem, the Ford 302, is particularly in the late 60s, is a little gem of an engine. Once it gets emissions choked and smogged in the 70s, it's not as fun, but in my 68 Meteor Montcalm, that little 302 is just a sweetheart of an engine. I love it. I absolutely love it. So 
There's some don'ts and there's some do's. What do you think? Did I miss one? Put a comment in the comment section. If you're not yet subscribed, make sure that you do because it's free. So click the little icon with the 67 Riviera and hope to see you again. Let me know if you enjoyed the Porsche chat. Take care.